All right, let me go ahead and get started, guys. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm going to welcome you to our panel on wellness. I know I can see people over there, um, and we have a lot of people online. This is our way of wrapping up the 50th anniversary um, which is this, of the existence of the Judicial Council, Administrative Office of the Courts, which I was just explaining is AOC. I'm Michelle Barkley. I don't even know if I introduced myself the first time, but I am, I am Michelle Barkley. I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm a long time attorney here at the AOC, but I'm also a nurse. I actually, I was a nurse before I went to law school and then I actually renewed my license during the pandemic um, just because I wanted to be part of the, part of the vaccine give out, give, giving out vaccines. Um, it was, that was a really hard time. It was a lot, of, a lot of despair and that made me feel better. We're gonna live stream this class. Um, we've, We've extensively advertised this class to the judicial branch, not really outside the judicial branch, but if somebody joins us from the state bar, they're welcome. Um, and we're also going to archive this conversation and we're going to make it available as a podcast down the road so people can listen to it in the cars. And because we want to make sure that everybody gets the information to stay healthy for the next 50 years. And we're going to cover a lot of information today. The purpose of us today, or we're going to talk about wellness, but we're going to focus on three things. There's lots of aspects to wellness. We're not going to talk about mental health, which is the whole can have be a whole panel by itself. But we're going to talk about exercise, nutrition, and sleep. There's some evidence that when you can get these three things in harmony and do well with these three things, uh, other things, other health issues also improve. And we have three wonderful panelists. So we're going to explore these um, topics for about an hour. I'm going to try to leave some room at the end. I'm going to keep hitting this button over here to watch the time. So the questions, I'm assuming we're going to have questions um, about some of this stuff. And I'm going to introduce our panelists to you in alphabetical order. First, we have Donna Blissett, who's a registered and licensed dietitian nutritionist. She has committed her entire professional career. She's at the end down there scanning 25 years to provide nutritional guidance for individuals on their quest to disease prevention and management. Her appreciation for health and wellness was established through volunteer work as a teenage candy striper at Lincoln Hospital in New York. During her high school years, her passionate interest led her to become a licensed practical nurse, educating young mothers about the importance of prenatal care. Through that work, Donna has been increasingly aware of the importance of nutrition for overall health management and disease prevention. We also have our own Judge Stephen Dillard, who serves Georgia on the Court of Appeals and has done so since 2010. His education is from Sanford University and College School of Law, where he graduated cum laude. We asked Judge Dillard to join us because we've been following him on social media and we've watched him embrace exercise over the past year, year and a half. He has posted that he's lost weight, that he feels better, like we can see that you're really disciplined about it. We're not surprised by that, but we want to talk about his experience over the past year or so. And we also have Dr. Ann Rogers, who's a tenured professor at Emory's University's Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing. She's an expert on sleep and sleep disorders. She earned a doctorate from Northwestern University in Illinois, a master's degree in nursing from the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri Columbia, and a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Iowa College of Nursing. She is board certified in sleep disorder medicine and sees patients twice monthly at the Emory Sleep Disorders Clinic. I found Dr. Rogers also by Googling sleep expertise in Atlanta. She popped right up. And I saw all of her papers and I listened to a bunch of her talks and I'm so glad she said yes when I asked her to be on this panel. All right, so we're gonna start with Judge Dillard. So, Dillard, you posted back in August 2020 that you were told by a doctor that you needed to make some healthcare changes, and you did. Today, you can run an eight-minute mile. That's that picture up there. Um, what motivated you to get going on that? Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for inviting me to be here. If you had told me back in August of last year when I really started this journey in earnest that I would be speaking on a wellness panel, um, you know, a year and a half later, I would have laughed at you. Um, I wouldn't have thought that was serious. Um, and also, I may say things as part of my journey that are wrong, and that's why I'm glad real experts are here. I am not an exercise expert. I'm not a health or wellness expert. I'm just a guy that and had enough of being tired. I went to my doctor, Mary Bell Vaughn in Macon, who I've been friends with for years. And, you know, I went in for my annual checkup and... She said, how are you feeling? I said, I, 
hey, I'm, life's great right now, but I said, I'm just, I'm tired all the time. I'm just tired. I don't, I don't feel good. And she said, you know, she calls me Stephen. She said, Stephen, I love you, but if you keep on this trajectory of not exercise, she goes, you're exercising. Are you? It's gonna end, it's not gonna it's gonna end badly for you. And you know, I think for the first time I knew I was out of shape. And you know, I'd I'd spent most of my, you know, younger years, uh, I wouldn't say I was an athlete in the sense of being a great athlete, but I did do a lot of sports. I was fairly active, I was thin for most of my life. And then I started practicing law, not to knock on practicing law, but you know, five pounds a year over the span of about, you know, it just happens. And um, I was just tired of being tired. And I guess what I'll say about it at the start of my journey, um, in the past when I I, I kind of yo-yoed a little bit over the years um, after I got on the bench, even kind of while I was practicing law, where I would always say, I need to lose 50 pounds. And, and I would go into it with that mentality, like, because, you know, when you are type A personality like I am, you have these kind of grand... I want to do this. I want to do this. And so I would always look at it with that. And this time when I started, I thought to myself, you know, I'm not going to focus on that at all. I'm not going to focus on the weight aspect of this. Tomorrow, I want to go and walk three miles. That's my goal. No matter how long it takes me, I want to walk three miles. Today, I want to get up and I want to eat a good breakfast or I want to eat a light breakfast, or I want to eat a good lunch. I mean, I started doing, and I don't think I'm coining a term here. Someone's probably already said it in the recesses of my brain. Kind of micro victories or micro living. Um, I just started focusing on living my life incrementally, which is a lawyer we do sometimes. Like I used to bill hours. I started like having that mentality. So that's kind of how I started on the journey. And I walked for about you know, 12 weeks just around my neighborhood. I didn't do anything else. Didn't go out and join a fancy gym. Didn't buy a bunch of, I used all my old shoes, which probably wasn't great um, because they were worn down because I hadn't used them in years. Um, but I did that for about 12 weeks and then I kind of plateaued and that's when I joined Orange Theory. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but I'm not promoting or endorsing as a judge Orange Theory. <laughs> Um, I, I just will say that that type of workout worked for me and I've been doing that. And, and I'll be honest with you, that's what I do. I don't do, you know, other than walking around my neighborhood or walking around the courthouse, other than that, that's like what I do. And I've been thinking about incorporating yoga and some other things as well, but I don't, some of the people that go to my studio, they like run the Boston marathon. I mean, they like cycle, they do all these other things in addition to doing like OTF, as we call it, three times. I do Orange Theory six, five to six times a week, and that's that's pretty much, I do an hour a day. And for my schedule, having to travel as much as I do, I do it early in the morning. It starts my day that way, and that's what works for me. That's probably more than you wanted to hear to start <laughs> off with, but that's kind of gives you a thumbnail sketch of, of how I started my journey and kind of where I am today. No, that's good. Actually, we want the, your questions kind of be a big, broad overview, and then we'll drill into some details. Um, let's let's move on to D to Donna. Tell us about the concept as a food as uh, food as medicine in general. Sure, absolutely. So the concept of food as medicine actually has been emerging. Thank you. Has been emerging more so recently. However, it actually uh, started way back in 400 BC by a man named. Hippocrates. Um, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. And so um, food as medicine basically reaffirms the alignment or the connection between food and our health. And this is incredibly important for the reasons that here in the United States, uh, poor diet is responsible, the number one um, killer, you know, the number one um, cause of death in the United States. And so when we look at dietary lifestyle, what we're seeing is the standard American diet, also known as SAD. And that type of diet is high in total fat, high in saturated fat, uh, refined foods um, made with white flour, also very sugary, uh, high in sodium, packaged, you name it. And so when I think about that, uh, I have to uh, realize that the remedy or the prescription is food as medicine. This is really why I 
studied nutrition because I was intrigued by the fact that we could actually manipulate the, the diet to have these positive health outcomes. And so here we are today where we have all of these diet-related conditions, i.e. diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, um, uh, heart disease, et cetera. And so we're using food as, as this medicine to treat or combat these illnesses, not only treat, but prevent the onset, which I think is very, very important because let's face it, we all want to be healthy, um, but we're not sure how. So here's the prescription. The prescription is a whole food, plant-based dietary approach. Now, sometimes when I say that, people automatically go, oh, no, she's talking about veganism. She's talking about vegetarianism. I want to say that small changes mean a lot. So let's think about that continuum. We want to be progressing. We're not looking for perfection. And I've seen in many people that I've worked with who maybe eat small amounts of meat, but they're eating the fruits, the vegetables, the wholesome grains, the beans, the nuts, and the seeds. And if anyone has watched the Netflix documentary on, uh, on um, what is it, uh, Blue Zones, um, it's, it's really interesting, yes, because they talk about what these five um, areas of the world have in common. And one is plant-based nutrition. And they are engaging in regular physical activity. And they're eating at least one cup of beans per day. So food as medicine is, is really critical at this time, and we can all embrace it on some level for our health and well-being. Great. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Rogers, let's talk about sleep. How important is sleep to the human body? It is absolutely critical. When they've deprived rats of sleep for longer periods than it, we could ethically do with a human, they, their metabolic system is destroyed. They die. Uh, we know that humans who don't get enough sleep, it ramps up your appetite regulating hormones. So you crave high fat, high calorie foods, which if you were starving would be very adaptive. Most of us aren't starving. Uh, we, it also contributes to insufficient sleep can raise your blood pressure. When they've factored out statistically smoking family history, just insufficient sleep alone. It alters glucose metabolism. They've kept medical residents up and their glucose metabolism and insulin resistance looks like somebody my age or older. And these are, you know, kids in their 20s. Uh, so, and repeated episodes of it make it even harder. So you're altering glucose metabolism, insulin resistance, which relates to type 2 diabetes. Um, it alters your immune function. That's why when we were giving vaccines, um, we recommend people get a good night's sleep. Uh, it affects your whole body. It also affects your mood. You may not be aware of it, but everybody around you is aware that you're cranky. And that's <laughs> when they've done studies of surgical residents they checked off mood irritation in the OR as one of the indicators of fatigue. So it permeates everything we do. It makes it harder to be motivated, to exercise, to stay out of the refrigerator. Uh, it's just like what you eat and your activity all goes together. So let's let's do go ahead and take a drink. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, so um, let's do a follow-up question on that, just because it seems like a natural way to keep talking about sleep. What are some of the sleep disorders that you see in your practice most commonly? There are 80-some sleep disorders. I work with only adults. The ones we see a lot are insomnia, which means trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. The reason I mention staying asleep, we get a lot of women in menopause or post-menopause coming in saying, I go to bed, I fall asleep, I wake up at one or two in the morning and I can't get back to sleep. And sleeping pills don't work for that. I've got you know issues with sleeping pills. But what is happening is they've developed sleep apnea. Apnea means not breathing during sleep. All of us have a few pauses each hour when we sleep. 
But when the numbers start creeping up, it affects our blood pressure. We are more at risk for high, heart disease, high, high blood pressure, stroke, and diabetes. And when we think of sleep apnea, the picture usually was a middle-aged, heavy-set guy, big neck, brawny, big gut. Weight has a lot to do with it, particularly with younger women and men. The heavier they are, the more at risk. However, during menopause, when women lose the estrogen, our airways become uh, more floppy, looser, and even if you're not overweight, you can develop sleep apnea. Um, and so a lot of what we see in clinic among middle-aged women that are, you know, their physician may be prescribing sleeping pills is actually sleep apnea. And in the South, we see a lot of sleep apnea because it is associated with weight. Everybody comes in, I don't want to use CPAP, which is a mask or a device over the face, blows air in and keeps the airway open. But people feel better once they get used to it, and we know how to help them get used to it. If it's milder, they can use a dental appliance, which is what like what you might wear for sports, and pushes the airway forward a little bit. This works on our slender, middle-aged women and men. Um, but people, when they treat their sleep apnea, feel better, they're, uh, particularly if they're moderate or severe, which most of them are by the time they get to clinic, their risk of heart disease and stuff goes down. Um, we also see it in patients with atrial fibrillation. And uh, my late partner had to be converted when they stopped the heart and restarted twice. Once he finally started using CPAP when he still lived in DC, went in for cardioversion, they didn't need to. He had converted back to normal sinus rhythm and they were able to start decreasing his medication. Came down here, I put him on a healthy diet, lost weight. Um, it makes a huge mm -hmm. difference to treat sleep apnea. People fall asleep and they don't even know it sitting in front of their computer. That's why we always like to have family members come in with them. Uh, and that daytime drowsiness, because their sleep isn't fragmented 30, 60, 120 times an hour to breathe, they feel better. But it does take getting used to CPAP. And there are tons of different masks now. We can get people fed and comfortable. Thanks. But it's dangerous not to treat it. Got it. Actually, I remember hearing, talking to a doctor who said it'll shorten your life. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you don't, uh, if you don't get, uh, use the CPAP. Mm -hmm. um, let's, Donna, let's talk a little bit more about blue zones. Let's talk a little bit more. What does a low inflammatory diet look like and what are yeah. its benefits? Yes, I think it's important um, to first define what that inflammation is. So we know that if we cut our finger, we have some sort of accident, um, we experience inflammation. Uh, the body is, is trying to come and aid that, that spot that's been cut or whatever. And so you might have some redness, some heat, or some pain. That's an acute inflammation. Then there's systemic inflammation, which happens as a result of your body's um, immune system trying to fight or defend itself, all right? That type of inflammation is associated with autoimmune conditions, i.e. Um, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or even multiple sclerosis. And in addition to those conditions, we find that inflammation is also associated with cancer and diabetes and heart disease. So when we think about inflammation, um, we want to consume a dietary lifestyle that is going to keep it at bay and um, prevent the onset of these chronic diseases and also help us to improve our quality of life. So if we explore a pro-inflammatory diet, one that contributes to inflammation, because poor diet definitely contributes to inflammation, as well as stress, as well as pollution and toxins in the environment. And so a pro-inflammatory diet is one that's going to be very high in red meat, very high in sugar, very high in fried foods, white flowers, all these things that we love to taste, right? So opposite to that, 
would be, again, that whole foods, plant-based dietary approach. With that being said, as I mentioned earlier, it is not necessary to completely cut out the meat. What we're telling people is to crowd out your diet with these types of foods. In addition, um, food ingredients such as vitamin C have anti-inflammatory um, properties, as well as omega-3 fatty acids. So if we can start to embrace more of that dietary lifestyle based in whole foods, we can actually keep that inflammation at bay. I was actually talking to someone recently. She was telling me about her son who had an autoimmune disease. She didn't explain exactly what it was, but she said, you know, I took him to see a dietitian and he changed his dietary habits. In fact, the entire family did. And they're all reaping the benefits of changing their diet to more whole foods, plant-based. And just a little bit more, what are the benefits you think that they're experiencing? Are they... Um... Sleeping better or feeling across better? the board, and, and this is something that I see in people that I work with on a daily basis um, more energy, more sleep, less irritability. See, because if we're consuming um, a lot of fried food, um, a high sodium diet, or um, white flour, things like that, we might experience fatigue. And so across the board, people are feeling better. And people that I work with, they're always amazed. They say, Oh my gosh. I, you know, I didn't think nutrition really meant anything, but I'm seeing that it it's really something because people are skeptical when they come. You know, I remember working in the realm of um, weight loss surgery with a, a young woman and she came to see me and um, she, you know, she didn't really want to hear what I had to say about nutrition. She, she said to me, I just need more insulin, lady. My blood sugars are in the 400s. And so I leaned back in my chair and I said, no, ma'am, you don't need more insulin. You need to change your dietary habits. And fact is, she came back four weeks later, turned everything around, blood sugars indeed were in the 400s, came on down to the 120s, blood pressure 150 over 100, came on down to 120 over 60, lost the weight. I said, how did you do it? She said, I embraced all of those dietary principles that we talked about. So you feel good, you sleep better, you have more energy, you're less irritable. I had one lady tell me, eating this way saved her marriage. All right, Jill, Jill, let's talk about motivation. How do you stay motivated? That's one of the hardest things, to do it every day or do it often enough. You know, I think, uh, well, first, I just want to say with regard to nutrition, it sounded like she was describing my old diet uh, there for a little bit with all the things that I ate. And I notice now, and it pains me to say this because I love, I've loved red meat most of my life, but if I have a hamburger the night before I go and work out, as opposed to a turkey burger mm -hmm. or, you know, eating a leaner meat. Yes. Um, I, can, I can feel the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I really can. So a lot of what she's saying is resonating with, and I mean, I'm, I love sugar. I mean, yeah. I love red meat. I love all, I mean, I'm 54 and I'll still would love to knock down a bag of uh, sour uh, the jelly beans, the jelly belly. I love, but, but <laughs> I've just, I've learned to like, and I haven't completely gotten, I have stopped eating chips and queso. That's my kryptonite. And I have had here. Um, but um, I've learned to moderate. Um, and I still have pizza every once in a while, but instead mm -hmm. of cooking a, a large frozen pizza, eating the whole thing, I'll have two slices. Um, I, I don't know that it's sustainable to cut out everything you love, but I do, I just want to say what she's saying resonates. Like when I, do eat a, a diet more like that, and I go to work out the next day. It's it really is like fuel. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 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 uh, yeah. so that's part of what I think will help motivate you is by mm -hmm. you you have to. I will just say this: I'm not an expert. For me, I had to completely rethink how I my relationship with food. Mm -hmm. I had to completely mm -hmm. rethink how I ate. Um, and, and even when I was still hungry, like stop, not, not just eating because I'm still hungry or eating because I was bored. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's hard. And it really, yes. that's why I had to do that in small increments. And I also had to learn not to beat myself up when I had a bad meal, you know, when I, when I, because mm -hmm. you're going, look, I don't care how disciplined you are. We're going to talk about motivation. Oh, you, yes. you, you are going to 
you are going to fall off the wagon. So, like, sometimes before I go to Christmas parties this season, I'll eat a kind bar, mm -hmm. you know. I don't know if those are good for me. Once yeah. again, I'm not an expert. But, um, <laughs> but I'll, or I'll eat a protein or something so that when I go, I'm not starving. Or I'll do that before I go to the grocery store so I'm not as tempted. Mm -hmm. So these are little things mm -hmm. I've done just along the way that have worked for me. As far as stating, staying motivated, one of the reasons you know about the social media aspect is I did it because I knew with my position that if I, that if I documented everything, it would put pressure on me because mm -hmm. people would see me and they would say, hey, how's the fitness journey going? And um, I also did it. One reason I, I posted consistently for a year is, you know, Facebook memories can be a blessing or a curse. And, um, and one of the things I wanted to do to myself, like kind of current Steve to past Steve was like, OK, if I do stop at some point, I want future Steve to have to see what I was doing that, you know, that I was, you know, and to, as a reminder every day that I wasn't doing what I needed to be doing. The interesting thing to me, you know, a motivation, one, I want to continue to feel like I feel. Um, I don't want to go back to where I was. And I want to say this too, because as someone who was pretty thin for most of his life and then struggled with my weight for a good period of time, um, I, I don't, for me, I, in changing my mentality, I did not focus on my weight or how I look. I certainly feel better now, but I think it's important to emphasize that, that, that you know, for, for when you're doing this, I, I think it's, at least for me, and I can only speak for me, it was unhealthy for me to focus on my weight and how I looked. Mm -hmm. I wanted to focus on how I felt. And, 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 and I think for me, I did not feel comfortable in my own body. There are plenty of people that are heavier and they're completely comfortable in their own body. They are healthy. They're eating right. They're, they're doing the right things. And that's, that's them and they're comfortable. I was not, I was at a point where I was no longer. So for me, a lot of this is very subjective. I don't want anyone to hear what I'm saying and saying somehow that, it's, it, it never for me was about weight. And that was the real radical change this past time. It was never about being thin or looking better. Now, do I, do I think I look better than I did was I, than I was at my heaviest? Yeah, I, I do. But a lot of it's because of how I feel internally. You know, I just feel, I feel more like myself. And so um, that was, a, that's a big part of the motivation. Um, I think the other part of it is, you know, I want to set a good example for my kids. Mm -hmm. I want, um, I, I'm for better, or for worse, I'm in the position I am. I want to set a good example because of the platform I have. And the most encouraging thing I'll say about the social media aspect, which is a motivator, is people motivate me. I get tons of private messages or people saying, I can't believe the transformation you know, what's your secret? And I'm like, there is no secret. Like, it's just hard. Um, yeah. You know, it, it is it is less calories. It is exercising. It is discipline. Um, but that has motivated me having people call me and say, I had a judge last night come up to me and say, I said, you look great and, and you seem happy. And he's like, he goes, you help motivate me. And that's really humbling because once again, I am not, I can't say this, I'm not an expert. You know, I'm not, and if you saw me working out, I do pretty well in the tread uh, when I do the little floor and the weights, and I, I'm stumbling through it to this day. I've been doing it a year and a half. I am by no means some great athlete, but to me, I think no matter, even in their days that I don't want to get up. I mean, I don't yeah. want you to think like this is, like I'm some sort of, I'm, I'm not some great example in that, like I'm not a great athlete. I'm not somebody that is going to break records, um, although I do pretty well for my age group at, at my studio <laughs> in terms of, um, but, um, and I have to watch it in, in, in being, you know, because I'm an A type personality, I have to watch like being too competitive. I'm not competitive with others. I'm competitive with myself. And the Orange Theory thing has these things where you have benchmarks, like the mile, the 12 minute row. And so you can see like how you did in the past. And so I'm always kind of like trying to one up myself. And so I, I, if you do these sorts of things, I think you have to be careful about not doing too much too quickly. Yes. It really is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, you know, I would, there's still things I want to do. Like I'm not content 
Um, I'm content with how I feel. I, I feel more like myself now. And I will tell you, with nutrition and exercise, I got off of my high blood pressure uh -huh. medication. Um, you know, yeah. I was on that for years. Um, you know, my, my resting heart rate was actually almost getting, it's now 50. Good. It was getting down into the mid forties yeah. and I was starting to feel a little dizzy. And so we got off that medication, but that saved me $50 a month. <laughs> and so when I pay my bill every month to Orange Theory, which is not cheap, um, I view it as an investment. And you don't have to do that. You can walk around your neighborhood. There are plenty of things you can do that don't cost money. But for me and how I'm wired, the first time I did that type of exercise, I was like, okay, this is, this is, this, I'm, this is my kind of, this is what will work mm -hmm. for me. And so anyway, I, I've rambled, but, oh, but <laughs> I will, I will say, um, find something you like. Don't, don't listen to me and be like, well, Judge Diller did Orange Theory. I should do Orange Theory. <laughs> I think it's great, but it may not be for you. Um, do something and, and do something. Even if it's just you start off walking around your house when somebody calls you on the phone, just go outside and walk around your yard. I mean, just start with that. Take the stairs rather than the, I mean, you don't, don't try to go run a marathon when you've just started working out. And if you find something that you love, whether it's swimming, Orange Theory, lifting weights, um, all of that, just find something you enjoy because if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to, you're not going to yeah. do it. It's going to be a short term fix. Anyway, I'll shut up. And, I actually have a follow up question, but you may have covered. Oh, sorry. And ahead. don't cut your sleep. A lot of my yeah. patients will get up early mm -hmm. to exercise so they yeah. can lose weight. That doesn't work. They need yeah. to keep their sleep the same amount. I go to bed earlier. I'll say that. And like, that, again, is incremental change. Yeah. You can't say I'm going to bed an hour early because yeah. you won't be sleeping. You know, it fits in with incremental changes in diet, incremental changes in exercise. Politics aside, I remember years ago when I heard something that President George W. Bush went to bed at like 8.30 or 9. Mm -hmm. So he could get it. And I thought to myself, that's insane. Like, who does that? Who goes to bed? And now I'm like, at least on that, politics aside, mm -hmm. he was a genius. Like 8.30, 9 o'clock bedtime. I'm like, yes, that is, that's amazing. So I have a follow-up question to you, Jeff Tiller. Uh, which you may have already answered, so just tell me if you have. I was going to ask you how you evaluate your uh, fitness health right now, but I think you've just told us um, uh, that you know your blood pressure is better and you're getting off these other meds. Is there anything you want to add to that? Um, my my blood pressure is, like I said, my blood pressure is regularly about, I want to say like 108 over 70 now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my, like I said, my resting heart rate's about 50. It was actually fairly low even when I was heavier, which was weird. It was like mm -hmm. in the mid to high 70s, which is mm -hmm. not terrible, um, but I didn't feel well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I feel good with where I am right now, but but for me, it's it's just about, it's a long game. Like I said, it's not like, oh, well, I've lost all this weight. Now I, I, I still, there's still stuff I need to work on with my diet. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not as consistent. I think when I got to kind of a, when I lost 70, because I've lost 70 pounds. When I, yeah. um, when I got down 70 pounds, I think I got a little bit complacent in my mind because I thought, well, I look good enough and, you know, and I feel good enough. And um, But even, even that, the one thing going back to the nutrition point and the sleep point is when I don't get the sleep and when I don't eat the way I should, even with being thinner and even with having a low resting heart rate, I, it, it's not just those, those aren't the only markers. I mean, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm much more in tune now with how I feel and I can notice when I don't do the things I should do. Um, uh, it, it, I don't, I, I feel it the next day when I'm, when I'm working out. So it's, it's about consistency. And, and the biggest thing I'll tell you is do not beat yourself up. Okay. I mean, yeah. and, and I think, I think the biggest thing when I started was, I was like, I'm so, I'm in such bad shape. I walked, I, I went out and timed myself and did a mile back in August of 2022. And it took me 21 minutes to walk a mile and I was exhausted. Mm. Um, and recently I ran a 745 mile. Mm -hmm. So I don't say that to brag. I say <laughs> that to tell you, if I can do it, you can do it. And it, it's not going to happen overnight. But just you go at your own pace. Everybody's journey is different. That's the other thing I would emphasize. Everybody's journey is different. And it may, 
it, it may have been taking me longer to get to where I am than others, but that's okay because I'm happy with where I am. Great. Let's go back to sleep. Um, Dr. Roger, you, we talked a little bit, but I mean, you, I don't think you said this already, but what's the ideal number of hours of sleep? I'm sure you get asked that a lot. I'm asked that a lot. And unfortunately, we don't have a good answer. It is variable. We know somewhere between seven and eight. We know if people are getting four to six hours, they're more likely to get ill or die. If they're sleeping 10 or 12 hours, they're more likely to get ill or die. But we don't know because these are large population studies. Maybe they're only sleeping a little bit because they're in pain or they're ill. Maybe they're sleeping a lot because they're depressed or they've got something seriously going on. You know, studies, you have to take them with a grain of salt. People feel best when they get One thing, an adult, if they're healthy, should be able to get up in the morning, stay awake all day, and go to sleep at night. If they're dropping off, they're either not getting enough sleep, which is quite common, or they got a sleep disorder. Uh, sleep apnea is underdiagnosed and undertreated. There are a few others, but uh, they're more rare. Um, so, and what we know is if you go on vacation for a week or two, you get up when you want and go to bed when you want, people sleep longer. That's closer in line with what they really need than when the alarm clock goes off. Uh, and have to get up. And I've found since the pandemic working more at home, I'm, and I've never been a morning person, I'm waking up just ahead of my alarm clock at seven because almost every day I'm getting up at seven rather than, well, some days I have to get up at six to get, you know, beat the traffic. Uh, so consistency helps, but we know it's somewhere between seven and eight. There are people that say, oh, I can get by on three or four. There are a handful of people in the world. It's not common. Um, and there are certainly some, and I know she was featured on the news at one point, one of the young lawyers that had idiopathic hypersomnia and was sleeping like 20 some hours a day until she was put on medication. She had a very unusual sleep disorder. Um, and that I do deal with the disorders of excessive sleepiness, but, it's usually sleep apnea that's causing it, or in, and a lot of people, it's insufficient sleep. You get up early because traffic on 85 is a mess. Um, you stay late because you gotta finish work or you're at home and you've got some chores to do. So you stay up or you're watching something or my occasional guilty pleasure if I get engrossed in a fiction book and I don't look at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's real easy to not get don't have demands on your time, how long you sleep. And that's probably closer to what you need. Let me ask you one more follow-up question on that. What interferes with good sleep? And we talked a little bit about hormones, but is there other stuff that can interfere? Yes. Um, I've seen some screens out here, laptops, phones. We used to say turn off the TV. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's all kinds of devices. They uh, emit blue light and how much the Glasses block, we don't know. If somebody's having trouble falling asleep, put the devices away two hours ahead. That doesn't work with my graduate students because they're busy, but, um, or teenagers probably shouldn't. Um, but turn off the screen. Um, you know, lighting in the house uh, can make it worse. Getting out in the morning, uh, especially if you're a morning person in the sunlight, can also reset your circadian clock, which helps. Um, I'm not a morning person, so getting up to exercise outdoors won't happen. Dog does have to go out, so I am out momentarily. Um, other things, obvious one is caffeine. It's in coffee, tea, certain uh, colas like Mountain Dew, loaded. Stay away from the energy drinks. They are full of caffeine and sugar. Um, so it's uh, also 
as people get older, they sometimes develop hiatal hernias or uh, GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflux. So you, if you have either of those conditions you want to eat earlier, don't eat at 8 or 9, and then go to bed at 10, because you're going to have some um, reflux or upset stomach. Um, so, well, But the big offender in most people's life is screens. Also, if you exercise late at night, it can bump up your arousal. And I'm not going to say don't exercise because there are too many good benefits. One that people don't think about is nicotine. Smoking uh, binds to a receptor in the brain, produces arousal. And when people quit, they feel lousy, but their sleep is actually better the day they quit. Uh, alcohol, big disruptor. May, you know, the teenage boys or college kids may think, oh, make her a little drowsy, that'll help. Um, it may initially make you drowsy, but it disrupts sleep. And somebody who's drinking too much, it really disrupts their sleep. And even after they dry out, their sleep may be disrupted for two to three months. It doesn't go away quickly. So it's, you know, alcohol, cigarettes, you know, I'm sounding like your parent, put your devices away. <laughs> no. um, Don't drink my Coke Zero. Right. <laughs> I do drink it. Well, I'm, I'm fond of iced tea, but I dislike sweet tea, so that's, but it is caffeine. I do read on an iPad. If I had trouble going to sleep, I would have to give up. And these are changes you can make gradually. You can gradually turn off the devices, start a half hour earlier. You can, you know, if you're a smoker, get rid of that. Um, That's a nice segue to develop. Let's talk about the, you, you, I watched one of your YouTube, or a YouTube video where you were speaking, you were teaching, and you had this phrase, rethink your drain, which is a, a quick, I want you to, See if you could explain that to them. Absolutely. Before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge Judge Dillard for his fantastic journey. Your testimony is amazing. Um, as a registered dietitian, we love, love, love to hear stories like that where people just make these changes. We know we're not, never perfect, but we know that we are moving along that continuum. So, yes. yeah, that's for you. Uh, rethink your drink. Yes. So, sugary beverages uh, are definitely popular in our world. Um, we love the taste of them. We love the buzz that they, they give us. Um, here's the thing. According to the CDC, 30% of Americans rely heavily on sugary beverages. They're drinking a lot of their beverages. And so what do these beverages look like? I'll get to that in a moment. I want to say something about sugar. Sugar is a calorically dense nutrient, which means that it provides a lot of calories, okay? Empty calories. And when I say empty calories, I mean it's not providing any major source of nutrition. It's pure sugar. And we know when we consume pure sugar, how we feel, we might get a boost of energy. And after a while, we drop like a hot potato. Okay? So what are these beverages that we're drinking? Well, sodas, cola beverages, coffees with sugar, as well as these sweetened syrups, um, sports drinks. Um, energy drinks, as Dr. Rogers just mentioned, um, and they have lots of sugar. In fact, I have a couple of props that I wanted to show you. Uh, this one right here is the amount of sugar in a 16-ounce energy drink. This is 14 yes. teaspoons. Yes. See, we, don't, we, we can't see it, so we don't know what it looks like. Um, this right here is a 16-ounce frappuccino with 12 teaspoons. Right? So we would never take a spoon and just pour sugar in a, a bowl and eat it like this. We're getting quite a bit of sugar. Right? Then, thank you. then we have, this is a 16-ounce sweet tea with 10 teaspoons of sugar. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this right here is a 20-ounce cola with 16 teaspoons. All right? So if we want to rethink our drink, we can actually do so much greatness for our body um, because excessive sugary beverages are associated with weight gain, obesity, type 2 diabetes, dental caries, cavities, and heart disease. Okay, so by rethinking our drink, we have to find 
other ways. We can still indulge and enjoy, but just not drink that six pack of soda every day. Speaking of which, years ago, I worked with a young lady um, who wanted to reduce her weight and feel better. And so she came to me and she was drinking six cans of soda every day. And she says, what can I do? What can I do? I said, just go down to one and see what happens. And when I saw her four weeks later, she was so happy. She was actually holding up her pants with a safety pin because she had lost so much weight. But what can we do to rethink our drink? Well, first of all, um, when it comes to sugary beverages, I like to encourage people to reduce the volume and then dilute with a little water and some ice and sip on it, okay? Because if we keep the same volume and add the water, we're still getting the same amount of sugar, all right? That's one thing. Another thing that we can do is try um, infusing our water. And by infusing, I mean adding lemons, limes, we can add mint leaves, we can make it flavorful. And actually this right here is, um, someone gave this to me, um, I want to say it's called a diffuser, or infuser rather, where you put in the cylinder here, you place either your tea bags, your mint leaves, or whatever you have, and then you pour the water in and you let it sit overnight, and you can keep it on your desk and drink your water. And this way, a lot of people say that water is boring. They can't deal with it, right? And then, of course, when it comes to your, your coffees, some of us like to stop at our favorite coffee shop in the morning and get, you know, one of those really big uh, coffee yeah. drinks with a couple of pumps of the sweetness. We can reduce the sweetness. Again, we're never going to be perfect. We enjoy the sweetness. Our taste buds love it. Our brain loves it. We have memory. We want to keep going back to that feeling. So my recommendation would be reduce, drink more water, and figure out what's going to work for you because we're all different. We're all bio-individuals, and what works for me may not work for you. But yes, rethinking your drink is essential to reducing those empty liquid calories that contribute to chronic illness. Can I ask a Of course. What do you, I know what you're going to say, but what do you <laughs> think about the, the zero sugar? Like, I know there's different types of sweeteners, but mm -hmm. like for someone trying to wean off of mm -hmm. that, um, like, I know there's obviously you don't want to drink like 10 Coke Zeros a day right, if you're drinking right. 10 Coke mm -hmm. Colas a day, but what if you're drinking two Coke Zeros? I mean, I know they're not ideal, but what, what are your thoughts about the zero sugar and like the Splenda, like I, I love tea, mm -hmm. I love sweet tea, and mm -hmm. I, I now drink the, uh, the zero calorie, the Splenda right. Milo's tea. Right. So like, what do you think about all the different? So um, this is a great question. Uh, a lot of times people ask me this, and what I will say is I personally am not a fan of the zero calorie beverages, etc. These beverages that use artificial sweeteners which are chemicals. And as I look at the research, what I'm seeing is that because they're like 100 times sweeter than sugar, they can contribute to cravings and they can contribute to that memory of sweetness on your taste buds that you continue to desire. Um, if I was going to prepare my own sweet tea or encourage someone to prepare their own sweet tea, I'd probably say uh, out of all of the sweeteners, probably try stevia and use that. I know a lot of people don't like it because it has a bit of an aftertaste, um, but that would be my recommendation. Um, I, I also was listening to a, a physician who talked about um, the possibilities that these um, artificial sweeteners can be linked to a disruption of the gut microbiome, as well as being linked to autoimmune conditions. So I'm sure there's more research coming out as we speak. So we are coming, we're getting close. We're going to stop this at 2 o'clock because that's we we advertise, so that's going to be a hard stop. So we've got 10 minutes. And um, I have some more questions here, but I wanted to stop and see if anybody in the audience had a burning question. See one there right there. Yeah. And I'm going to repeat it, so go ahead. Yes. Um, Instagram has ruined my life in that I look at all these people that are making their own breads and this kind of thing, and you get to all this information, and I find out that flour... You know, like when our grandparents made it, they would take their wheat berries down to the mill and mill it that day and make bread. And flour loses like 70% of its nutritional value after three days. Plus, we bleach it and do all this other stuff to it to make it shelf stable. So by moving down the food chain and, and convenience in modern life, it's like these things don't have nutritional value. And so it's so my question, I guess, is, is it the white flour and bread or is it modern white flour and the bread? Because, you know, 
my grandmother ate bread every day, right? Mm -hmm. So, but she baked it. So, mm -hmm. how, how do you how do you navigate that? How do you kind of block that time? That's a great question. Yes. So, first of all, when it comes to Wait, white, before we go there, just for the viewing audience, we're asking a question about the flour and the nutritional value of flour. Sorry, go. Yes. Yes. So, what I was going to say is that white flour has been highly processed. It's refined. We start out with a whole, a wholesome uh, grain, and then it's refined. We remove the essential parts of it, and what we're essentially left with is um, carbohydrate or starch. Whereas when it's intact, we have the B vitamins, we have more protein, and we have more fiber. Uh, so when we're purchasing bread that has been baked, like at a local supermarket, um, my my concern would be that it may not be optimal, but if you go to maybe your local bakery when you can talk to the bakers there and actually find out what they're using, a lot of times they actually use more superior um, ingredients in, in their bread. And of course, baking your own bread, trying to, to get the best product that you possibly can so that you have ingredients that will yield a more beneficial product for you. Because yes, a lot of our foods are kind of got fillers in them. The nutrient density is, is lost um, because we're kind of relying on the middleman, and I call the middleman like the factory or the plant that is producing the food, whereas if we, we lived on a farm, we know we're getting everything from the earth, et cetera, but when we start digging things out of the earth and we send it to the plant and then they process it and then they put it into the supermarket and then we're eating that, it's it's concerning. I even think about like the farmers, like here in Atlanta, there are so many urban gardens and it's a fantastic experience if one can actually visit one of the farmers market because the farmers actually harvest the night before they take everything to market. So the food that you're getting is so nutrient dense and it's so exciting to actually taste arugula that has flavor versus yeah. what it's like when you get it from the market in the stores where it ha is, has no flavor. So yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can be in control. You can be in control. And I wanna say it is, it's, I know that it takes time. It takes time. People always say, I don't have time to do all of this. Like who has the time? Well, I know personally, I have discovered meal planning and meal prepping. And it saves me so much time. I tell you, on the weekend when I go to the market, I get all my stuff and I, I take the time to use the oven. I'll put some sweet potatoes in the oven. I've got, you know, I'm chopping up all the salad ingredients. So I make sure for my week, at least three to five days, I have two protein sources. I have two um, starchy vegetables or I have a grain and a starchy vegetable and I have a big salad. So I have a, a nutrient balanced meal every single day. And I get that time back in the evening because I'm not scurrying around the kitchen trying to make a meal for the next day. So I might spend three hours on my prep, but I get that back in the week and it's fantastic. And you're not eating out and you see you're saving dollars and cents. And for me, that is quite exciting. Uh, um, and this is more practical and they may tell me I'm wrong about this, but one of the things I will say is when you're on the road, as, as much as I travel across Georgia, mm -hmm. There are fast food restaurants where you can, you can eat healthy. Um, like, for example, one of the things I've done, especially if I can sit down, is I can get a market salad at Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. I can get the light Italian, which is a low-calorie mm -hmm. dressing. And even on top of the chicken, I can get a 12 grilled chicken nuggets. I can put that on the market salad. And all of that meal, huge meal with lettuce mm -hmm. and fruits and vegetables and grilled chicken is like less than 600 calories. Mm. Um, so yeah. you don't have to, you don't have to sacrifice. You can go, and I'm not promoting Chick-fil-A, right? Yeah. You can, you got, <laughs> all of the restaurants have different options, but, but that's something to keep in mind too. Sometimes when we get on the road, we think, oh, maybe this will be my cheat day. And if, if it is, have at it. But no, remember that there are those options uh, that you can actually continue to eat healthy, even even at mm -hmm. the highly processed. Or even if you're traveling. Yeah. Uh, I was in southern Italy this summer. The food was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It wasn't heavy pastas. It was lots of vegetables, mm -hmm. steamed, roasted, you name it. 
And yeah, there was a little bit of cream and butter used, but it was judicious. Mm -hmm. yeah. And fish every night. I mean, you can do it even internationally, or we think of Italian cuisine as being calorie heavy, butter, noodles. It doesn't have to be. And I love a good filet. I'm just going to tell you, I'll yeah. never fully give up red meat. <laughs> but but I, when I was starting to lose, I, I'd ask some, some nutritionists and they're like, filet every once in a while is not a problem. The problem is mm -hmm. not so much the meat. If it's a lean cut red meat, it's the peppercorn sauce mm -hmm. that you drown uh -huh. it in. You know, it's the potatoes, the kind of creamy. But so, I mean, now, instead of doing potatoes, I'll do a filet with nothing. And actually, it tastes better because you can actually taste the meat. And then I'll eat asparagus. I've never, and my, my wife can't believe I eat green things now. Like, oh, that's <laughs> now, like I eat broccoli, broccolini, asparagus. I'm eating all these things for the first time. And you're like, how did you go? You're like, but literally, I have not tried a lot of these things until I was 53 years old. Wow. Mm -hmm. well, you can do it. Yeah. You've got a hand over there. Where is it? Your last question. Go ahead. Same topic. Um, same topic. Um, you're the nutritionist. Your thought on organic versus regular vegetables. Mm. Uh, High question. Yes. So, hmm. okay. so, so the. So the question is organics versus regular. Yes. So I got to put on my farmer hat. Okay. So um, what I know is that when we're making the comparison between organic and traditionally grown vegetables, we'll find that traditionally grown vegetables have the use of pesticides, chemicals, right? That's a concern. We know that chemicals can be a disruptor to our system, right? Like um, causing or contributing to inflammation, as we talked about earlier. Now, organically grown vegetables, if you go into the supermarket and you see the, the, the term organic, what mm -hmm. that means is that, and let's dig deep, that all except for 5% of the ingredients used to grow that food are um, healthy or not chemicals. So they may use 5% of chemicals. Now, something, so that there's a big difference. However, you do have some. Of course, so a lot of people will wash their vegetables thoroughly and baking soda, vinegar, or what have you. But I will say this, and this is, I think, important because we want to also support our, our local farmers, okay? So speaking locally um, with regard to the farmers, when they grow their food, they're using a method is called certified naturally grown, okay? What that means is that there is a peer review system. So if I'm Farmer D and you're Farmer Joe, I come to your farm, you come to my farm, and we check each other out to make sure that we're growing our foods without these chemicals and we're using maybe neem oils or you know some of the other uh, ingredients that we use to, to grow our foods and keep the, the pests at bay. I actually looked at some, some research. I actually recently graduated from um, in a local urban agriculture program. And one of the papers that I had to write was about um, organic versus traditional. And so it was found that organic vegetables were more nutrient dense than the ones that were grown traditionally. Now, I will say for many people, it's very difficult or challenging to afford um, these types of foods because we have not decreased the prices on organic foods. So I would say if someone had a choice, purchase the traditional, um, clean it thoroughly and make it work. That's what I would say. Free-range chicken, chicken eggs, compared to just regular chicken. So if anyone was ever in the South Georgia, they see a chicken farm, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a big building and what have you. Mm -hmm. And I had a talk with someone and I said, well, it's, it's impossible to have free-range chickens and have them lay their eggs everywhere. Because mm -hmm. you spend more time picking the eggs. Mm -hmm. So all chickens stay in the chicken farm. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? I will be completely honest. I don't know a lot about eggs and chickens and things of that nature. I don't even want to attempt to try to answer that question. So I apologize. No, I apologize. It's right. So it's two o'clock. So we're gonna bring we're gonna bring it to an end. I'm sorry. We've got, <laughs> I know, and I'm really glad that you so please join me in thanking this panel. <laughs> And uh, can you guys hang around for a few minutes? Sure. 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 We are going to break with our online audience. Thank you guys for joining us, and everybody have a great day.